Hi, good morning, everyone. Good day and good evening. Wherever you are at this moment, we welcome you to, the, to our PCST webinars 2021. My name is Ana Claudia Nepote. I am part of the scientific committee of the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network. We are an association that brings together professionals and people interested in science communication worldwide. A year ago, PCST started a series of webinars in order to stimulate conversations and reflections around the various topics of interest that converge in the network. Today, we will talk about teaching science communication in pandemic times. The sessions began a discussion at the last PCST conference in Aberdeen last June. Now, we can talk about how did we manage to keep our students motivated, how to retain as much social interaction as possible in a digital learning environment, how we deal with the change significance of our field. Today, I have the pleasure to be here as moderator with our guests. Lisbeth de Bakker from Utrecht University, the Netherlands, Dominique Brossard, from University of Wisconsin at the United States of America, Janice Limson from Rhodes University in South Africa, and Vanessa Guimaraes from Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. We also have Luisa Masarani as producer of this webinar. So before we start, I would like to invite you to use the questions and answers section to post your questions ideas or comments that you would like to share in this hour. To begin with each of the speakers, they, they will have five minutes of participation to start a broader conversation included of all us. So welcome. And the first uh, is going to be Lisbeth the backer. You have the, the floor is you, Lisbeth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'm going to uh, kick off with my brief presentation. And hopefully you will find it informative. I hope everybody can see the presentation now. My name is uh, Lisbeth Bakker. And since 2006, I have been science, communi science communication lecturer at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And today I want to discuss the challenge I faced when COVID-19 uh, really forced me to change my way of teaching science communication from small interactive face-to-face -face groups to fully digitally and online. Why doesn't it want to move forward? There we go, sorry. <laughs> And to illustrate my learning curve, I will tell you about the adaptations that I made to an introductory course in science communication for my bachelor science students. And uh, the course already existed for five years and it was well appreciated. The evaluations were good. So actually I had only two worries left. How to keep the all important, oh dear, now, oh, it's moving ahead at high speed. <laughs> I'm sorry, why did it do that? Oh, there we go. So I had worries due to COVID-19, how to keep the interaction going. And another important aspect was how to create a real group feeling amongst the 24 students that joined me for this course. Now, my main personal aim was actually how to keep them all uh, with me in this course during this online period of 10 weeks. I had 24 registered students. Normally in a group of 24 students, I would lose two by the end of 10 weeks. And I was hoping at least that uh, this time I could get the same result. So what did I do? I set up an e-learning environment, uh, which is shown on the slide. Um, and I thought it worked really well to uh, provide the students with all the information and the assignments necessary so they could make a very good preparation. And then we could join each other in the online learning session, the digital session when we saw each other online. So we could discuss about the assignments, go into depth, have group discussions. Uh, and I made sure that the students made all the preparations at home 
So only small presentation time, short pitches were necessary during the time we were together. Also, as a way of getting to know each other, I asked the students in advance to prepare a one to two minute short digital video clip of themselves. And here you see uh, one of my students. He decided to film himself outside uh, in advance of the course. And uh, these were also very nice clips that we could discuss in terms of communication. What clips stuck out and why was that? Was that because people were present presenting themselves so easily? or did they have a nice context, or did they show very interesting things? So it was a very good way to get started. In addition to the learning environment, we had, of course, our online sessions, and those were facilitated by MS Teams. You see the environment for that. And I went from an old system for four hours a week sessions and two hours a week sessions to three sessions of two hours, on the Monday, the Wednesday, and the Friday. So every week we met three times. And during those meetings, I made sure we uh, at least one of one hour of those two hours was dedicated to working together in small breakout channels. So they got to know, and each time they met up with other students. So by the end of the 10 weeks, really they got to know everybody, all three, 23 other students in the course. And finally, one of the things that I want to share with you is that I made per week a special COVID-19 assignment. And this COVID-19 assignment was always uh, connected to the theme that we were discussing in science communication that week. So risk communication or journalism, this is the one for journalism. And this, made, uh, this gave the course a feel that it was very relevant and up to date. But also it was very easy to get the students motivated and talking on what was going on in science communication at that very moment. So mission accomplished. Uh, at the end of the 10 weeks, I had lost only two students out of my group of 24. And the evaluations told me that they had appreciated the course. They had learned a lot. And most best of all, they had really felt that they had got to know each other, even though they'd never seen each other face to face. Well, uh, my other tips and hints I summarized for you on this particular slide. I hope um, uh, it has been informative and that um, you've learned a little bit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisbeth. It's very interesting to know how you are teaching now in this a digital context. Our next speaker Pleasure. is going to be uh, Dominique Brossard from University of Wisconsin at United States. The floor is you, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Claudia. Thank you, Luisa, for organizing this uh, uh, this webinar. It's always a pleasure to see you, you know, well, virtually and hopefully at some point PCST face to face. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first, uh, just to, to repeat what Anna Claudia was telling you, uh, I'm at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the United States of America, and I direct the Department of Life Sciences Communication. So basically, everybody in the department teaches courses related to science communication. And uh, the few remarks I'm going to give today are drawing on, on the experience and the feedback of my lectures. It's not just me, obviously, that uh, that I'm talking about here. So the, the 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 one of the main challenges that we face as we move in the online environment is that uh, classes really vary by format. We have classes that are with eight students, grad students, uh, you know, in a seminar series where discussions and uh, and uh, a critical thinking are around the scientific studies, the norm, to uh, lectures with 30 students, to 400 students in a big lecture hall where, you know, uh, the professor is there lecturing on a specific topic. So all those classes had to go uh, online, uh, as you know, and each of those settings, face their unique challenges. So I think I'm, I had some some few pointers for small classroom, like uh, Elizabeth was saying. So I'll leave it aside because uh, this was an excellent uh, point that she uh, she told you. And I'm focused more on like the large lectures. So what happened when you have a large lecture, how you keep a student motivated? First of all, 
interesting enough, good for us, it seems that actually it was easier to motivate students in the big online lectures than it was in the face-to-face -face big lectures. Because we noticed that, the, first of all, students, for those that are lucky to have access to the internet environment, I mean, we just assume here that there was no problem and everybody was, uh, you know, with a laptop and internet connection. That's another type of issue, equity issue that we can discuss in the QIA. But assuming that they were all there, they are so used to texting and chatting and so on that they were fully taking advantage of the chatting features of uh, the platform we were using. In this case, it was Zoom. And so we noticed that actually students were interacting more in the online environment than they were in face-to-face. -face. That some students you would never hear in class because they're afraid to actually raise their hand and talk. We're actually chatting and, and, and talking to us a, a lot in the online environment. So I think really taking advantage of like amazing features that platforms such as Zoom can, uh, can offer through the breakout sessions, through the chatting, through uh, the, the whiteboard and so on, I'm not going to list them all, is crucial. So take as many online training as you can to become as proficient an online teacher that you can. Rely on your colleagues that are all ready to share their expertise, uh, such as us here. Be delightful to answer any question. This, I think, is one of the must to manage uh, students motivated. The second thing I want to uh, to deal uh, to to address here is how do we deal with the significance uh, of the, our field of work that suddenly became significant? Well, actually, it was amazing for us. We I've been part of a lot of uh, of task force to help local government address COVID-19 related uh, uh, problems, and the expertise I shared with these people were also, you know, shared with the students. The students were part of the work. The students were helping. The students were integrated in the community using the skills they had used to class, and we were work all together to try to actually make sure that the expertise were shared. So I think anything that happens that's relevant in the world that we can use in the classroom for the students to actually make a difference was actually fully appreciated. And I think, obviously, I don't hope that the pandemic is going to come uh, again sometime soon, but any example in the community where we can get uh, our students involved in a practical turn, what we call service learning here in the United States, I think is a key to make things work as smoothly as possible. And I leave it here, just a few pointers that hopefully we can discuss more later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. I, I really like you pointed this problem for many of us that is e equity in access to internet. So hope we will talk about it later. Now I would like to invite Janice Linson to, to talk with us about this interesting topic. Thank, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to, to join this discussion. So I'm coming a little bit left, uh, well, a little bit left field. I'm a scientist. Um, doing science communication. Um, and I've got a short little little PowerPoint, if I can just go to that. Um, let me just start it over there. Okay, so um, okay, so my research is actually in how we integrate science engagement into the postgraduate training of science students. So I'm in biotechnology, and I think as many of you um, will know, it's the, it's a it's a, at the interfla interface of civil disciplines. Um, it's a, a field that is intimately geared towards social economic um, benefit. So areas of health, agriculture, water, energy, and biodiversity. And a really core part of our work is trying to develop new products and new processes. And what we realized early on is, is that our students often were not getting to meet the communities for whom they were doing research. So we had, you know, so in my department, oh, excuse me. So in my department, we've got research in stem cells, water treatment, bioenergy, disease monitoring. But our students as science students traditionally would not actually meet those communities or have any, you know, um, meaningful gauge, engagement around their research. And so we formed the, this um, biotech space where students would not just um, get training, you know, the traditional training, um, you know, in the traditional research and, and lecturing, but we actively incorporate the science engagement 
into their, their postgraduate projects. So a lot of this resonates with the responsible research and innovation um, um, framework. Um, and our challenge then was how to integrate this communication so that it is a meaningful part of their research and so that in such a way that it, it benefits them, benefits the communities as well. So we looked at several, uh, this is just a brief snapshot to tell you what, so that you can get an idea of what we lost <laughs> when COVID hit. So we, we do very simple things like speed meter scientists, we are students who um, you know, talk about their research in an informal setting. We had models where our students would test prototypes with community members um, as a means to see what it, you know, what the challenges might be if you, you know, down the road. Um, we conduct surveys with community members around um, new prototypes that we had in the laboratory to see. So this the idea here was is that we'd um, engage with them ahead of actually making a final design. So in a co-creation model. And then of course we'd engage healthcare workers as well in, in terms of establishing their needs. So when COVID hit, um, everything closed, our research groups closed, um, and everybody was of course confined to their um, confined to their homes. But obviously, and as Dominique was just mentioning, it actually provided quite an interesting opportunity for science engagement. And I think it really brought science and the role of scientists to the fore in a way I don't think we've ever experienced. Um, so we rapidly formed a, a, a task team and we engaged our students heavily in this, our postgraduate students. And it wasn't necessarily by design that this would be a training or teaching opportunity for them. Um, and so, um, but this is actually what happened. So we formed a, um, it was a great opportunity for two transdisciplinary approaches. So involved scientists, community engagement specialists, we had pharmacists, social scientists, um, people speaking different languages to do translation, healthcare workers, journalists, um, editors, and of course, a lot of university academics and, and students got right involved. And we did a whole range of different things. And it's actually been interesting. Um, thanks very much for the invitation because it's allowed me just to reflect on what that really meant for our students. So we did a lot of, um, um, so it was, where I live in Grahamstown, um, there's a lot of people who did not have access to information, to, to news. In fact, the local newspapers stopped um, producing um, newspapers. So we funded and printed several thousand copies um, of the local newspaper in three languages and, and tried to address the misinformation. So our students got involved in the writing of the articles, they got involved in producing the different kinds of graphics. So it really challenged them, even though this was not a part of their research. There was a lot of, I think, training going on. Um, students hand delivered newspapers um, to people and then in socially, you know, physically distanced um, settings, they could um, gauge information about misinformation, etc., concerns, which we then addressed in, the, in further editions of newspapers. Um, the students, the translation team was made up purely of students who then produce, um, you know, produce the material in different languages. And this was a really important part of our science engagement um, exercise. Um, we did a lot of short videos, a lot of content for WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook. A lot of our students suddenly became radio experts, um, you know, producing short little videos as well, getting involved in community Q&A after church. For example, some of our students would go and um, find areas where they could speak with people. So I think just, um, just to wrap up then, to reflect on this, I think it highlighted um, the critical role science communication plays globally and it emphasized the need for certain forms of, of research. So our students then could reflect. So a lot of our research is in rapid disease detection. And I think it, it really emphasized for us. So I think while there was science engagement training, it really helped us reflect on our role as the critical role um, our students can play as scientists and in science communication. And then just one final point is, is that we started viewing a lot of our research now through the COVID-19 um, lens and then reflecting on the relevance of our work. So I think all in all, um, um, I think we, we, we pull through to the other side and, I, you know, there's a lot that we can, that we can learn and I think still learn. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. And I, I really like this point that you said about this uh, transdisciplinary way of teaching and learning and it's also is very important. 
Now we have uh, Vanessa Guimaraes from Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil, our last speaker this morning. Oh, your micro is off, Vanessa. Your sound. Forgot to open yeah. the mic. Now, okay. It's okay. Now it's okay. Uh, first of all, a good morning to everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this event. Since 2016, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation offers a master's degree in science and technology in health communication. I teach with a colleague, Sonia Mann, methodology of scientific research, a mandatory discipline with 15 weekly classes. So our focus is on preparing people to do research on science communication more than practice. Uh, from March on, uh, everything when um, all educational activities of the foundation went on remote mode. And we decided, uh, Although we had concerns about uh, the, the, the access of our students to equipment and a, and a good internet connection, we decided to proceed and uh, begin the course, the course anyway in a remote uh, way, in a remote modality. Brazil is extremely an equal country and not all people have access to the web or especially to a good internet connection. And after a consultation with the students, we decided to start anyway. And from them all, we all enter in a steep learning curve. Our disciplines that were in person and whose classes were planned to be four hours long needed to be reduced and adapt. And we had to learn how to use video conference and educational platforms as Zoom and Google Classroom. Methodology of scientific research is a challenging subject to teach. Lots of theoretical and technical stuff. So during classes, we use many anecdotes and even jokes to keep the students engaged. But soon enough, we discover that in Zoom classes, the punchlines tend to get lost in the silence of muted microphones. Besides, many students had bad internet connections and had to turn their cameras off to keep connected. And sometimes it was hard to tell if they were in fact following the class, although we asked repeatedly for their, for their feedback. So we decided to finish each class with a short assignment, mostly a couple of questions and began the following class discussing their responses. This approach helped to enhance the engagement during classes. They liked the discussions at the beginning of the classes and the participation increased. But what really made a difference was the final task of the discipline. Usually we provide, provide the students an opportunity to conduct a research project of their own on a single theme, choose by themselves for the whole class. We believe that the experience of participating in all stages of creating and performing a research project the choice of the theme and analytical point of view, the elaboration of the research instrument, collection and analysis, analysis of data is an enriching process, process for them. Despite the difficulties posed by remote, remote teaching and students' bad internet connections, we decided to keep the final task as usual. It was the best decision. Fortunately, by this time, Google had liberated the free use of Google Meet and everything went smoothly with the group work. Students were enthusiastic about the project, especially because the topicality of the topicality importance of the selected team, fake news and COVID-19. In Brazil, fake news was and still are a real problem regarding many aspects of the pandemics. Since the promotion of ineffective treatments like hydroxyl color, chloroquine, and such, to questioning the safety and efficacy of vaccines. They, they acknowledge the social relevance of the future role as science communicators. The group work was beneficial for the social interaction between, between students as well. There were many lessons we learned during this challenging period uh, of remote teaching. But the main one, I think, was that we should try and adopt a more horizontal approach to teaching. 
try to make our classes more a community of learners instead of a traditional lecture setting. <laughs> and that's it. I think that I went really fast, didn't I? <laughs> ah, it's okay. Thank you, Vanessa. And I really like the, the, the idea that you share with us at the end that make a more a learning community. So that's very important. So now I would like to uh, invite Luisa, who is supporting us with the questions of, of all of you are, are putting in this section of questions and answer. Please keep doing it to, in order to get this conversation with you. Welcome, Luisa. Thank from you, Brazil. Anna. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So we have tons of questions, which is great. <laughs> questions <laughs> and comments. So uh, to try to 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 raise uh, as much as as much questions as possible, uh, we are going to group uh, some questions so we can try to answer our or at least uh, most of all. So we have the three most. Uh, uh, now it just changed. <laughs> that is quick. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there is a uh, there are two questions that are uh, kind of in the same uh, in the same way. Which is the first one is from Tos Gascon from Australia. So he says, so given the success of online teaching, what balance of online and face to face will will you move to once uh, COVID has uh, faded? And, uh, but uh, Harry James also goes in the same direction. So he says, are you all aiming to move back to teaching primarily in the university setting or more blended learning approach? And, uh, and uh, so these questions are kind of similar in the same direction. And Anne uh, raised the following question, how can we keep the advantage of the live chat easier, less scary in a physical teaching environment. So I suggest that the, you answer the questions and then we go to a second round. Anyone wants to start answering maybe the same order is that or just okay. spontaneously? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer actually the, the first two questions a bit. Uh, because we are in the lucky situation in the Netherlands that our universities have opened again. We've just started this week the new academic year and I'm allowed to teach my classes again. So I had a class on Tuesday of 13 students face to face and a class of 20 students face to face. And it made me very happy and the students very happy. Uh, but what did we retain from our experiences for long, from last year? As I showed in my presentation, we have this online learning environment that we set up with all the exercises and assignments there. And we felt that that was a huge uh, improvement over what we had always done. Because normally you just go to, to a lecture and then you give the information and then the kind of deep knowledge and what you do with it comes later. But now you kind of take that out of the setting of meeting face to face. You inform before. And then you have all the time available to really deal with the issues that, that they are grappling with, that, we, that you have to learn. So definitely all the work that we've done on the uh, learning environment will stay. But we're also very happy that the discussion about what it really is to communicate properly and how to tackle the problems properly, that is much better going face to face. And it's much nicer. I have the feeling that we took a lot of fun out of learning and being a student because we were forced not to see each other. I think that's what I missed. And I think that's what the students missed most as well. Thank you, Lisbeth. Uh, someone wants to add? Dominique? Yeah, I can add that uh, that's an interesting question because to some extent it's also a political question at the institution level that we not we not always we don't always have the luck to choose what type of you know classroom we want to have and uh, and we came back uh, uh, at, on campus as well here, and we were mandated by the university to have 90% of the classes face to face. So even the people that would like to stay online, you know, couldn't stay online. So that's been said, I'm very happy to be in the classroom. I have 35 students. 
Um, and I think, uh, uh, although the online environment, as we say, it, it can be extremely fruitful in promoting interaction and so on, I think you all agree that being physical present with someone in a room has, uh, you know, the energy that you cannot reproduce with all the efforts you make. You still have that, that, that need of having, you know, somebody physical present. So I think this is great. However, Somebody pointed in the question and answer that they were able to use a um, lecture from all around the world. Look at what we're doing now. We, we are all around the world, you know, doing this. So I'm still bringing that in the classroom. I'm going to continue having, you know, like speakers from all around the world that can do that. So uh, at least maintain that possibility to have people that cannot be physically present there. Thank you, Dominique. Janice or Vanessa, Janice? I agree with uh, most uh, of the points our colleagues made, but and then there is another thing also. Uh, we we made the, the selection of this uh, this class of 2021 remotely uh, last year, and it was very good. The result it was very good because we had candidates for another states. Uh, our course is in Rio de Janeiro and. Uh, it's very difficult for people from another states of Brazil, this gigantic country, to participate because of the costs and so on. And I think that we can manage some kind of a hybrid uh, kind of course. Maybe it will be a good outcome after all. And adding to the, the point that the, the, the using the learning platforms, it's, it's very good for planning your course because you can plan the asynchronous activities in advance and have everything there. So it's, it's, it's very good. There, there, are, there are good points. There are silver linings, some silver linings on this experience. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. Ahead, um, I think I think from my side, um, we would probably never, have, you know, such a big group would never have been able to come together. Um, and there were people from different parts of the world as well. And certainly, I mean, it was it was a way to keep connected. So amongst people in science and science communication, we were, we could feel connected at a time when we all felt so isolated. And I I think a lot of people right at the beginning also felt quite fearful of, you know, what this meant for the future. So I think it certainly played an important role. And I think it was important for my students as well. And, you know, right at the beginning when they couldn't really do too much, pulling together around a common thing kept us, kept us focused on, on the bigger picture. So, yes, I think there are benefits. But I must say, getting back to the lab and our students getting back out into communities, um, they couldn't wait. So, yes, <laughs> I think we, we worked with what we had. Yes, thanks, thanks, Janice. Lisa, more questions? Please. Yes, <laughs> so just to clarify the criteria, I'm, uh, I'm reading the question. I'm going to read three uh, for the questions. And I'm uh, uh, Lisa, looking at the... Uh, Louisa, yes, sorry. Can you can I ask? I'm, I'm really interested in the question that wasn't answered. The third question is how can we find a way to kind of give the silent student in the group, now we're all face to face again, an opportunity to talk? Because digitally they weren't afraid to talk. And now, of course, we're in the group together. I'm, I'm really curious because I don't have an answer. So I'm just looking at uh, Dominique and maybe Janice and Vanessa, whether they might have an answer to cater especially for those who have an opinion, but are afraid to voice it? Yeah, that's a really good question, Lisbeth. And I think in this case, you know, like uh, uh, applying the, 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 um, uh, the traditional ways that we promote discussion in class, which is uh, what I do is that I, uh, I, my students have to change spot all the time. And so they never have the same neighbor. I ask them to talk to the person next to them, for example, if we have a sign of reading, and together summarize the main finding on a tweet that they have to actually 
post on Twitter with the hashtag of the tag of the class and so on. So different techniques that make expression, not only verbal, but also like promote that interaction within very small groups. And it could be, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever way you do to uh, have uh, some other way of expressing yourself. So basically, I'm trying to do that. I mean, he's been quite successful in the past. Hopefully you will in this class, but maybe I should tell you at the end of the term how this goes now that we have online in between. Thank you. Can I go ahead? <laughs> oh, okay, Vanessa wants to share something. I, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, normally, when we do these uh, small assignments, uh, I choose some students randomly <laughs> to answer. And uh, I normally choose the ones that are more, more shy or less participative because I don't know why. <laughs> Sometimes they were not very participative because of their connection, because they they fall off the, the class many, many, many times along the class. And and others are really shy and reluctant, reluctant in participate. But uh, Brazilians are very talkative in general. So once they feel comfortable, they talk a lot. It was uh, really difficult to finish the class sometimes, <laughs> isn't it, Luisa? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can I read the, the next questions then? <laughs> yes, and, uh, just, uh, yes. If you allow me, Anna, just comment what uh, Vanessa just raised it now, that we felt a, a very important difference between the group uh, last year, uh, the group that uh, started the course, the master, and then they got the, they were hit with the pandemic, and uh, the the group of this year, this year they are yes. so much talkative, and, uh, yes. and, and they are the case terrible. that they don't stop talking. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I, I should stop talking myself. <laughs> uh, so just to clarify, uh, I'm, uh, there are some uh, very interesting questions here that I'm not going to raise yet because they are not directly uh, linked to the subject of this seminar, which is teaching in pandemic day. So I'm going to focus in first in the questions related to the topic of this seminar. So uh, Nabita uh, um, asked the following, can we please talk more about equity for areas where equity can be a real big problem? What could be other innovative ways of reaching out to the students? And then uh, Carlos Cubitosa, uh, uh, he has a question for Dominique. He says, you emphasized the potential of online uh, tool to promote interaction with students do you think that this can work also if, uh, with the participating participating students have no uh, I'm sorry also if the participating students have no previous knowledge of the professor and major organizer of the activity with a trust relationship that must be established uh, for the first time and then there is a, a question from uh, Bridget she raised an important uh, point to hold on because this is uh, this shot thing. This question and answer is uh, is alive. <laughs> so uh, Bridget says, I also got positive feedback from my students. Yet the seminar papers were not as good as in previous years. This could, of course, have been a coincidence. How are your experience? So I think that now we have plenty for talk and then uh, we can uh, go back to other questions. Thank you, Luisa. I, Dominique, I can please. start with the, oh, sorry. <laughs> I can start with the question that was asked to me and then I can I leave it to my colleagues here. Uh, you raise an excellent question. I mean, the issue of trust in the classroom and elsewhere is a really like a key on communication, right? If you don't have that trust established, it's really hard to, to have that rapport. And I agree that for students that didn't, haven't met the 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 the, the lecturers, the, the, the instructors before 
an online class, it may be a little more challenging to establish that report. But it's possible. I think, uh, uh, you know, promoting, uh, for example, office hours where you are one on one with the student, making sure that the students are heard, making students this, the, the, that uh, I think uh, uh, Lisbeth was giving that example with her little video that you are fully interested in their lives. It's not because you're online that you don't care to hear about them and so on. I think the same techniques that we use in the in the face to face environment can be very fruitful online. And I mean, and again, among all the classrooms, in my department, everybody reported a positive experience. But just for a, a note on the equity issue, this is something that, as a director of my department, profoundly uh, uh, bothered me. How can we make sure that actually all the students have access and how the all the students can, you know, uh, uh, fulfill their educational goals? Uh, in Wisconsin, believe it or not, in rural area, the internet is very bad. And a lot of students had to go back home and, and had to uh, to go to the public library, go to the coffee shop and so on. So that means that they had to turn the camera off. They had they couldn't talk because they didn't want to bother other people. So what, what we did, number one, we were lucky enough to be able to lend some laptops to students. And number two, for those that had to connect in those kind of environments, let us know. So we know why your camera is not on. We know why you cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, be uh, interactive in class, but also give some flexibility. Say, look, we'll meet with you at any time that we can, that we know you can, you know, on face to face. So really be flexible, acknowledge that for some people it was extremely difficult. And it's not because they didn't want to interact, it's because they couldn't. Thank you, Dominique. Maybe Janice, you want to add something from South Africa? Um, thanks. Thanks very much. So in, in our situation, the students involved were all postgraduate science students. And so I think there's a um, it is a different it's a different group. And what we what we did was we actually we formed several task teams to manage different aspects and then invited people to choose which groups they wanted to belong to and what activities they want to do. So the small groups worked within um, those groups. And then I was a member of each one of those groups. So we formed WhatsApp groups, and then um, we were able to chat and keep the conversation going. There was also a, a bigger um, main group and um, you know where people could share. But I certainly found that in the smaller groups, some people were more willing to share ideas than in the, in the bigger groups. So I found that a really useful tool was just to have breakaway groups. Thanks. Thank you. Is that or Vanessa, you want to add something? In regard to, in regard to oh. equity, uh, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation has uh, uh, many policies uh, directed to students uh, in, during the pandemics. I don't think that our students needed uh, to use some of this. Uh, I don't know, because Luisa was the coordinator at that time, and now I am the coordinator. But uh, there are other courses uh, with students uh, in underprivileged conditions that don't, don't have internet, don't have uh, equipments, and they uh, bought uh, uh, mobile ships uh, with the uh, internet plans for those students to to have access to to the internet and also land equipment to notebooks and tablets and other equipments to uh, make possible for them to follow up their courses so uh, we have this uh, this concern um, trying to to ease the the, the situation um, uh, regarding the trust <laughs> This is difficult. This is hard, even uh, face to face. <laughs> but uh, the, the 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 class of 2020, uh, I met them because I participate in the the selection <laughs> process. So I already knew them in person. I met them previously. The 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 class of 2021, I didn't, but I was in the remote interview and selection. So. And they were much more easygoing. <laughs> I, I think that they were my, more used to, to the situation. The, the, the 2020 class was pretty shaken by everything, as we yeah. were all, uh, all were and are still. So 
uh, I think it's, it varies from class uh, to class. And mm -hmm. of course, the, the, the in-person in relationship, uh, it's much better to establish trust and, and foster a better relationship. relationship. Thank you, Vanessa. Lisbeth, please. Uh, I would like to add, add just a little bit. The issue of mm -hmm. equity is also, of course, very important in many realms of society at the moment. Um, but um, I'm in a lucky position that our students um, have good facilities and feel involved and can access the, um, the information that is there. Um, so for our own student, the issue of ex uh, equity is not a personal problem very often. So what I do is that uh, the last two years I've invested in um, a small course dealing with the issue of equity in informal science education and in science communication and journalism uh, to make everybody more aware. I think it's a responsibility of, of, us, of us educators that um, communication and language is power, which can mm -hmm. be very inclusive, but at the same time, very exclusive. And it's there and it's unseen. We're not aware of our biases, especially in the Netherlands. We often say, you know, oh, but we don't have a problem, do we? Because we don't see it. It's so normal that we just often say it just doesn't exist, but it does exist. And it's, I think it's my task in this course to look at gender bias in popular science texts, because they're often much more targeted at men than at young women. So if you want more women in science, we need to start communicating differently. The same with mm -hmm. our institutions. Museums are very much involved and very aware that they want to make their institutes more accessible, their materials more accessible. But it, you need to do more. We now know, thanks also to Emily Dawson, we need to do much more than just saying, OK, is this understandable for everybody? No, because lots of French people, minority groups just don't think that that is their world, that science is something to do with them. So uh, there's a very hard task, but a very important task there. And that's what I want to make my students aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Lisbeth, for these uh, ideas also. And probably we're going to start our last round of, of questions because we have around 15 minutes left for this webinar. I don't know, Lis Lisa, please. Yeah, sure. So John said, uh, the beauty of science communication is that people can do it in different ways, using what they have uh, uh, at their disposal. Do you feel that the creativity inherent uh, in science communication lends itself well to handling adverse situations such as those caused by uh, the pandemic? And then we have Michelle from Australia. She says, uh, is there pressure from people in your university to stay online for reasons other than pedagogical? Who holds the IP associated with recorded materials? That's a very interesting and different questions. And then we have uh, uh, Elizabeth Ton from UK. She says, uh, did anyone find that their student got tired of talking about COVID as the constant example? Our group always ends up discussing whatever is the new in the news. But I think uh, by about March 2021, the court was quite tired of talking about uh, as well as living the pandemic. So these are the probably the last three questions. Thank you, thank you. I just remembered that we have uh, around 12 minutes left. So please, uh, who would like to answer these questions first? Janice or Dominique? <laughs> I, I can just briefly, briefly uh, make some comments. So I think the one thing, I mean, just regarding creativity, the one thing that really stood out and I think surprised all of us was the creativity and talent in other areas other than science um, that our students had. So this provided an opportunity for them to explore other aspects. So, you know, writing or going on radio, some people had never been on radio, but they were absolute naturals and have been repeatedly asked to come onto local radio stations throughout, you know, throughout the, the months following. Um, so there was the graphics, there was designing posters, all of that. So um, yes, I think science communication does lend itself, you know, the, the inherent creativity there. But I think it, you know, 
an absolute benefit for us is exploring other aspects of who we are as scientists. Um, and I think that, that in a way, when our scientists had to, our students had to think about the communities, that was absolutely key for us because we need our students to be thinking about the community for whom we are doing research. So I, I feel that the, the creative ways in which they did that um, certainly benefited them and, and obviously the, the, the outputs as well. I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Janice. Dominique, please. Yeah, so I can comment uh, on, on some of those points. Uh, first of all, who owns the intellectual rights to the videos and so on? I mean, in our university, university retained the rights for those uh, recordings. And actually, this would be an interesting question for the PCST network, what happened with the, these videos that they have they have recorded and so on. Um, uh, as far as like talking always about COVID, that actually... I myself got tired of doing all the COVID related stuff and I was really involved in, in outreach and so on at the national and, and the local level. But I think for the students, for their own sanity, it was extremely important to make sure that, you know, first of all, number one, we would, we were on this all together. Number two, we will get out of this all together. Number three, there's life before, during, and after the pandemic. And we want to make the, the world a better place after the pandemic. So I think, you know, in any situation, talking about hope and show how science can help and use our collective wisdom to show that we are a community thinking about the later, you know, events and that the later context is important. So choose examples that focus on reconstruction and so on and solidarity and not just COVID per se, I think was very important. Thank well, you, Dominique. Would, Vanessa, please. I would like to, to talk about the comment about the, the questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the intellectual property of our lectures were ours. <laughs> uh, we posted, we, we, I recorded my lectures on my computer and uh, I posted on Google Classroom to the students, but they are mine. They are not from the, the Phil Cruz institution. And uh, the hours connected, I, I didn't have a, a control over that, but I do many other things. I teach uh, science, uh, uh, methodology of research at the, the master's course. Now I coordinated it, but I also work at the Museum of Life, the Museum of Phil Cruz. So uh, I had another things that I do. So I stay connected most of the time. And uh, regarding the crea creativity, uh, yeah, uh, or the quality of the works, there is a question about this, wasn't it, Louisa? Uh, the quality of the works. Yeah, uh, I, I, I noticed, uh, I, I realized that the, the 2020 class, the quality was not great. Uh, comparing to uh, in presence classes, but 20, the, the, the class of 2021 had remarkable <laughs> uh, 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 works uh, done as the, 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 by the end of the discipline. It was incredible, the, the, the production. So I think that the people becomes to get used to the situation. Although they are, we are all tired of the pandemics, uh, we are in the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, that's the main health institute in Brazil. So we are in the epicenter, epicenter mm. of the discussions on the pandemic. So it's, it's very hard to escape from it. The, the, the theme from the, 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 the final work of the 2021 class was COVID and mental health. And it was very interesting, the results. So uh, I think that uh, we can't escape this team from now. I think maybe when we come back to our normal lives, we begin to, to change the subject. Thank you, Vanessa. We have only around five minutes left. So I would like to listen to Lisbeth and maybe yep. Luisa to I'll close the session. Thanks. Oh, that's okay. Not least, um, it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Louisa. Yeah, um, I will keep it short, but there are two ad additional things that I want to add to all the wonderful stuff that we've heard uh, today. 
uh, there was this question of a pressure to stay online and to keep teaching online. Um, uh, that's not the case at Utrecht University, but we have a certain pressure of keep on offering our courses blended because COVID is by no, no means gone and we will have students in quarantine or students ill at home and they need to tap in. So we have our online channels open during the face-to-face -face sessions. It's not a full experience, but at least they can be there and they can ask questions and shout out if, if they want to. We also have a few international students who can't come to the Netherlands because of traffic and whatever, you know, no flights. And we want to accommodate them as well. So I think we will grow into a fully hybrid form because it has its advantages too. Um, that was one thing. And then on a positive note, what I've seen in terms of quality of our students is a difference from a student who did our two year course in one and a half years because she could kind of take all the online courses and do it at her, her own pace. And she was an excellent student. So she finished it wonderfully in less than the uh, allotted time. And other students who were at home were completely demotivated, couldn't get going, didn't really know how to. So it, uh, I think uh, it has, COVID has forced us to explore a new world of teaching, which fits some of our students wonderfully. And let's hope and learn that we can take those nuggets of gold out of the digital online teaching world and implement that and, and fuse it to what we are doing face to face with our groups. So hopefully that that will happen. Hopefully, Luisa, it's. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add add something. I, someone is asking: Is is this forum teaching science uh, forum just for PCST members? Please, Luisa, you can comment on this and maybe start closing okay. this interesting conversation. Yeah, it's a, it's a pity because there are still so many interesting questions. <laughs> I recommend that you give a look at the Q&A because uh, there are very inspiring things to think about. But anyway, the time is short. And so this uh, seminar is actually an uh, initiative of a, a group of us from PCST. Uh, we start calling us the PCST Forum Group. <laughs> and uh, the idea uh, came because uh, we, we decided to, we realized that uh, many of us teaching sci uh, teach science communication in different parts of the world. And uh, we would love to, 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 to share ideas and strategies and challenges and uh, concerns, etc. So we were supposed to meet last year in Aberdeen for a workshop and then the pandemic uh, uh, <laughs> arrived. So we never did, but uh, we start meeting in a kind of informal way and we suggested to, to the PCSD network to create this new forum uh, specific for uh, PCSD teaching. So it was not launched yet, but we are uh, working in a specific part in the website with uh, materials and try to think what we can do together so i put my email in the in the chat uh, so if uh, some of you want to contact us uh, i will obviously share your email also to with the other members and uh, we can uh, uh, meet virtually and uh, start uh, 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 widening this conversation with other people and other uh, course programs from different parts of the world. So that was uh, uh, what we wanted to share. So by the way, I'm, I'm talking not as Luisa, but as a uh, part of this uh, group, which joins about uh, 10 people. So Lisbeth, for example, Marina Joubert, and uh, uh, other people that I will forget, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, it's about uh, 10 people and we hope to, to, to have a, a, a bigger group now with uh, uh, many of you. Thank you so much. And also I would like to add a big, big thanks to Jenny Metcalf, who is uh, behind the scenes. And thank you, Jenny. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. And thank, and thank you very much, uh, all of you, for being here today. And please keep following us through our social networks, PCST, at Twitter, at Facebook. We are going to have another very interesting seminar at the end of this month in September about scientific culture. So hopefully you can share uh, be with us in, in this next seminar.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.